scripture comes from Matthew 5. I will be reading from the ESV version, and you can follow along in your, the insert in your bulletin. Please listen to these words of Jesus. You have said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. For it is also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let it let you say let what you say simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for those words. We pray now um, by your spirit, that you would send your spirit, that we would be present to your spirit here in this space, that we would have awareness of what you've got for us. And uh, yeah, have mercy on me as I try to deliver your, your message to your people. And all your people say, amen. amen. So, yeah, in this section of Matthew chapter 5, we're hearing from Jesus, as Tricia said. And this is toward the beginning of his so-called Sermon on the Mount, which starts at the beginning of chapter 5, goes all the way to the end of chapter 7 in Matthew. And in this particular section, he's disrupting a lot of what the people had come to believe. And he uses this phrase over and over and over again. He says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So you've probably heard some of the things that he said. He said, uh, outside of this passage, in the other parts of this section of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, "Um, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, be gracious to anyone who would defend you. And if if someone wants to strike you on the right cheek, turn to them on your left as as well. And then right before this section, he says, says, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, anyone who is even angry with a brother or sister shall be liable to judgment. And so the same goes for this passage that we're working with today. He's disrupting what they've always believed, and he's going back and forth between these these phrases. So he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who even looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You have heard that it was said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, which is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, which is the city of the great king. And so, what do you make of this? What do we make of this? What do we make of this sense that he's actually presenting a picture that seems more intense 
He's upping the ante. Here's what I would say, just as a point of clarity, that in this passage, Jesus is not issuing moral commands meant to burden us. He is unveiling what it means to be fully human as God intends. He's not, he is not issuing moral commands meant to burden us. He is unveiling what it means to be fully human as God intends. These teachings are about living into God's design, which is the whole point of our current sermon series. Relationships by God's design. And it's hard to understate how important that is because we can so easily think that Jesus is raising the bar and in the, in the process raising this bar for how we earn favor from him, how we get into this or enter into his favor. But as we've covered repeatedly during this sermon series, uh, we want to avoid getting the gospel all backward that we have to sort of climb the rungs, climb the bars, so that we can earn favor from God. The true gospel actually starts at the top there. It starts with who God is and what God does, that he is, he is savior, deliverer, redeemer. And so part of what he does is he saves and delivers and redeems. He doesn't start with what we do and who we are, that bottom part of the ladder. So it's not about us being moral people who live out moral edicts and thus then earn our way up the ladder toward God and earn that favor from God. It starts with God who by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, for God's glory alone offers us favor without merit and redemption without us having to earn it. And it's because of God's grace that then we are both inspired and empowered to live into that design. So that's what happens as we come out of God's grace. Inspired and then empowered to live into God's design. A design that includes truth and goodness and beauty. That said, I think it's important to realize what Jesus is up to here. He's not issuing moral commands meant to burden us. He's unveiling what it means to be fully human as God intends. And so these teachings are all about God's design, which we live into from grace, not in order to get grace. So just want to cover that again. I think it's really important. It's so easy for us to get the gospel wrong. And to get these, this passage wrong. But yeah, if this is about God's intentions, then what are the verses 27 through 37 of chapter 5 saying about those intentions, about God's intentions and God's design? I think they're telling us something about what it means to remain in faithful, to remain faithful in relationships, especially in the marital relationships. So this is something I've been doing all through this series. If this is your first time with us in this series, I've been talking about the implications of the passages that we look at, the implications for our relationships. And in this particular case, talking about the marital relationship, covered other relationships, including what it means to be single. This happens to focus some more on marriage. But yeah, I think it has huge implications for marriage and the way that we understand relational faithfulness and thus the whole reason I've entitled this sermon Relational Faithfulness. And as we dig into this, I want us always to remember that we don't be faithful so as to earn God's favor. Instead, we rely on God's grace in order to be faithful. We don't be faithful in order to earn God's favor. We rely on God's grace in order to be Faithful. So as we proceed through this, we should continually feel a pull toward this table, which is exactly where we'll end up at the end. A table that offers, where Christ offers himself, offers refreshment and sustainment and everything that's needed by his grace so that we might actually live into this design. So, in verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, clearly he's talking to the men in the group, right? 
He's saying, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of the members of your body than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than it is for your whole body to go into hell. So if you're not picking up on it, he is, all this stuff about tearing out eyeballs and cutting off hands is deliberate exaggeration by Jesus. So just as a point of clarification, nobody wants you to gouge your eyeballs out today. He's really fond of exaggeration, especially in this part of the Sermon on the Mount. Just before this, um, you know, in the part that I had told you about before where he says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit murder. Um, But you should, and then he says, I say unto you, you should not even be angry with a brother or sister, which is not the point of exaggeration. The point of exaggeration comes after that because he says, so much so, you should not even be angry with your brother and sister. He says this, he says, when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister, then come and offer your gift. So in order to see the exaggeration, you have to know what kind of gifts they offered back then. It wasn't cash. It was usually, most often, either a live or dead animal. So, if there, when you bring your gift to the altar, you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift. So this too is exaggeration. Like, it would be tremendously irresponsible to live a dead or a live animal while you go and try to be reconciled to your brother and sister, which could take a while. Which could lead to a stench or could lead to an animal just running amok. So, same thing here. Plucking out eyes, cutting off hands, deliberate exaggerations used to make his point. He's so serious about God's design for marriage that includes fidelity and exclusivity and sacredness, these things that we've covered along the way in this sermon series, that he doesn't even want adultery to take place in our hearts, let alone some sort of actual physical act. And before we go any further with that, I should say, please don't hear what Jesus is not saying. I often say, don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what Jesus is not saying. He's not condemning the impulse we feel when we see someone as attractive. He's not condemning that impulse as though we have full control over that initial impulse. Instead, he's casting a vision for a response to that impulse. He's calling us to avoid the intentional gaze or the lustful imagination that follow after that initial impulse if we engage the temptation. Because to indulge the initial impulse by engaging the intentional gaze or lustful imagination is to go against God's design, to come back to the point. Because God's design is for that desire to be fixed on the man or woman who is our spouse. And anything else kind of stains or or mars the gift. And in Jesus' eyes, that's tantamount to cheating, cheating on them in an actual physical way. So, uh, yeah, so I think there's two things to be said about that initial impulse, things that need to be held Intention. So for a second, it is both, it's a gift. So that's the first thing. It's a gift. It's part of the gift that God designed for each of each other, designed us for each other. And one of the ways that we're brought together is through that attraction. So in that way, the initial impulse can be seen as a very natural, reflexive part of the experience of, of, of a God designed and God given desire for intimacy. And that initial impulse is also part of the curse in the sense that God's design is disrupted. That's part of what we affirm, at least in Christian circles, that God's original design in Genesis 2 is disrupted in Genesis 3. And our desires can be unbridled and lead us into temptation. And it doesn't just go away after we get married and find the gift part. There's still the part that's part of the curse. So we get to experience 
a little bit of the kingdom come, but also that it's not yet fully here. And in that way, the initial impulse can be seen as a natural, reflexive part of the experience of being a fallen human being. A son of Adam or a daughter of Eve who has disordered and misdirected loves. And the good news, in light of it being part of the curse, is that Jesus reversed the curse. And in, that, in this case, he grants us the inspiration and the power to overcome the temptation. That it may be part of the human experience to see someone and feel attraction to them. But it's not part of God's design to indulge every inclination. Instead, once we recognize it, we can, by God's grace, look to deny that desire and redirect that desire to our spouse. So all that to say, don't hear what Jesus isn't saying. He's not condemning the initial impulse, neither is he condoning it. He's not condemning it, neither is he condoning it. Instead, he uses this exaggerated language to compel us toward God's design. And in the process, he's really clear and really challenging. Because he's saying erotic desire, though itself good and God-given, can be this source of temptation that could lead us all the way to the fires of Gehenna. Which is the word that's used there, the Greek word to translate for hell. I like it better. Sounds like something you shouldn't want to go toward. Gehenna. And so we can say yes to desire when it hits us at an appropriate time and an appropriate place within the confines of marriage. And when it strikes inappropriately outside the context of marriage, then by God's grace, we can be prepared to say no through a basic act of Christian discipline. That's one of the things Dallas Willard says about the Christian disciplines, that all of them can be categorized, categorized as things we say yes to or things we say no to. So we say yes to study the Bible in prayer. We say no to food when we fast. And all those things just help us to say yes or no in everyday circumstances, including saying no when we're tempted in the wrong direction. And in light of all of that, I appreciate this quote from N.T. Wright. Because we're, yeah, yeah, cutting off those temptations, those desires. And he says, this is not repression, as some people sometimes suggest. It is more like the pruning of a rose, cutting off some healthy buds so that the plant may grow stronger and produce better flowers. Choosing not to be swept along by inappropriate erotic passion may well feel on occasion like cutting off a hand or plucking out an eye. And our world has frequently tried to tell us that doing this this is very bad for us. That it would be bad to deny ourselves and feel like we're plucking out an eye. But for neither, for neither the first time or the last time, we must choose to obey our Lord rather than the world. Personally, I don't often like to think of that we're just opposed to the world. We're in the world, not of it. I love that phrase. But I, um, and, and I don't want to set us up as always opposed to the world. And here's what's true. The sexual ethic that Jesus advocates for is decidedly different than the current Western culture. And we're being called by Jesus even in this present moment, but not for the first time or the last time, being called to obey our Lord rather than the world. And why? Because God's design doesn't match the prevailing assumptions of what is a fallen world. And that it instead could be Like he talks about, if we cut those things off, it could be like the budding of a rose. It could be something that's good and true and beautiful. Now, in addition to God's grace, which is sufficient for our weakness, good reminder, there's another thing that can help us greatly here as we try to engage um, against a lustful imagination. And that's one of the other key texts in this sermon series. We've dwelled a lot in Genesis 2. This feels like part 6 of a Genesis 2 sermon. Um, But we also looked at Genesis 1, 
that God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, cattle, all the wild animals of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created them. That people, you and me, are made in the image of God. And we are the pinnacle of that creation. On day six, the very last thing that's mentioned, we are the pinnacle of that. That even though sometimes we can look at each other and not like each other and not like what we see, you are actually the pinnacle of God's creation, made a little bit lower than the angels. And even though that image gets distorted and twisted a little bit in Genesis 3, Genesis 5, right at the beginning, Genesis 9, they, they uh, say that the image of God is not lost within us and that we carry it with us everywhere that we go. And that's important to keep in mind when we think of these admonitions against lust that Jesus is talking about. Because lust takes people made in the image of God and turns them into objects made for our pleasure. And when we objectify people, we dehumanize them in a way that dishonors God. Because people are not objects. I think that's really helpful to remember just in general. But especially within the context of this conversation, that by God's grace, we'll remember that every time we're tempted to give in to the desires that are unhelpful and just see people as objects, as fulfillment of those desires. They are instead people made in the image of the Most High God, sons and daughters of the same one that every one of us call Father. So yeah, this has implications for our understanding of marriage, for our understanding of relational faithfulness, both to our spouse and to all other people that own shouldn't be treated like objects. And Jesus says even more about this relational faithfulness. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So pause right there. Notice Jesus creates a rule, this little rule about divorce. It's okay. For what reason? Specifically because it goes against God's design. Specifically as we've covered it. What is God's design? That man and woman should leave father and mother, hold fast to one another, and become one flesh. So he's specifically saying when it goes against God's design. 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall, shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say Be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So I read all that, all the way to verse 37 there, because I want us to see that Jesus' comments about divorce are not unrelated to the passages that come right before and after. The passages about lust, the passages about keeping our word. Because it may be stating the obvious, but if people can control their bodily desires on one hand, And we're committed to complete integrity and truth-telling on the other. There would be fewer, if any, divorces. Because when lust and lies have been allowed to grow up like weeds in the midst of a relationship, they're bound to choke out the beautiful, fragile plant that marriage is. That that rose that N.T. Wright was just describing. And this is precisely why we want to come back to the first sermon in this series, Identity in Christ. If we as individuals are found in Christ, and if we as couples are centered in Christ, then our marriages are much more likely to reflect God's design. Because when we're in Christ, then we can have you know, all the strength we need in the midst of our weakness to fight the lust. And we can have all the strength we need to actually be people of our word. 
We can have the strength we need to live into God's design for marriage. And that's precisely why the statistics about divorce are actually kind of remarkable. Because in general, yes, about a little less than 50% of marriages result in divorce. But the divorce rate among Christ-centered, church-attending, missionally active couples is like infinitesimal. Some people estimate one in a thousand, one in ten thousand. It's hard to truly measure. It's hard to measure what it means to be Christ-centered, church-attending, missionally active couples. But I think you know it. So yeah. The other thing that I want to say about divorce at this point is that I want to acknowledge that in all these passages that we've been examining, divorce has come up a lot. It's come up repeatedly in these Bible passages. It's come up a lot in the learning hour conversations we've had over in the Family Life Center after the services. And I want to acknowledge that for those of you who are divorced or have experienced divorce, There have been some awkward moments along the way, and here's what I want to say about that. First, your identity is in Christ, not in your marital status. It's one of the things I tried to really lay on heavy on September the 19th. I hope you continually come back to that and are secure in that. I talked to one person specifically who said, yeah, there's been some awkward moments, and I keep coming back to that. And I pray that that's so for you, that your identity is in Christ, not in that marital status. And second, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about our approach as a church. What do we think about divorce? Because as a big C church, bigger than Faith Reformed Church, I think we've swung the pendulum pretty widely in our approach to divorce. That it used to be, maybe in the 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe you know before I was born, um, that if you got divorced, it was, you were excommunicated from the church. You were kicked out of the church. And as a result of a couple of factors, first as a reaction to that, that sort of harsh treatment for anybody who went through a divorce, but also as, um, I, I think as divorce became more per- permissible in the wider society, I think we as a church have swung the pendulum completely the other way such that a lot of things go unsaid and and things just happen. But instead of swinging the pendulum entirely the other way, uh, I don't know, here's what what I want. I want to hope it's what we want. That maybe we want to hold the tension, hold the tension as much as we possibly can, for as long as we possibly can, as often as we possibly can, to hold the tension between exalting God's design for marriage, fidelity, exclusivity, permanence, and hold that intention with the reality that we live in a fallen world that's full of flawed people. And in that fallen state, a lot of things go wrong including spouses that sin in major ways against each other, precisely what this passage addresses. And divorce seems like the only way through. So, so, so no, it, it, it may not be part of God's intended design, the part we want to exalt, but yes, it happens. And when it does happen, there's space for grace and redemption in the work and all that's done in the midst of that separation. And I think our challenge as Faith Reformed Church is to hold that tension as best as we possibly can. To not swing the pendulum that says, hey, divorce is wrong, get out of here. Or swing it the other way and not talk about it at all. That our challenge is to hold the tension as best we can. To exalt God's design and help couples who are having difficulty... Because there is grace and there is redemption so that you can maintain God's design and live into it in such a way that if you prune those things like N.T. Wright was talking about, it could be more beautiful than you ever possibly imagined. We want to help people fight for their marriages. And we want to hold the tension on the other side and say, hey, part of the core theology that we affirm as a church is that the world is not as it should be and we are not as we should be. 
that we, above all people, as Reformed people, are pretty big believers in total depravity. And that short of God's grace, that depravity can get in the way. And we're waiting for the kingdom in all of its fullness. And before that, until, until then, we're going to have to deal with some divorce. And sometimes for what Jesus talks about, infidelity. Sometimes for what Paul talks about. Paul talks about uh, if you're married to an unbeliever and that unbeliever walks away from the marriage, he seems to make a lot of space there for that. Sometimes for something that the Bible does not explicitly mention, um, but is easily surmisable, and that's abuse. That it's okay to leave an abusive situation. And in fact, if you're in that situation, we want to be the kind of place that can help you. It's one of the, I think it's one of the best parts about having Andrea on staff now. Even more advocacy for people, for women who are physically, emotionally, or spiritually abused in their marriage. And that we don't want any of it to happen. And yet it can so easily happen, even in our midst. And in the midst of it, we want to say it's okay to leave that situation. And we want to help you. So if you're in that situation, approach me, approach her, approach somebody, please. And in the midst of all of these situations around, what does it mean to look faith, to be faithful in the, the midst of relationships as God designed them? I hope and pray that you reach out for God's grace. That if it's a matter of having to oh, I need help to fight this temptation to give in to that lustful imagination that you would bring that to the foot of the cross. That's what we sang earlier, right? Bring all your failures, bring all your addictions, come to the foot of the cross. That we're going to come to the table now, symbolically, to the foot of the cross, to the source of all grace. And if it's a lustful intention, if it's a marital, a marital issue that doesn't really reflect God's design, that you would come reaching out for God's grace. Acknowledging, because this has huge implications regarding just how much we need God's grace. That we don't live into these moral standards so as to earn God's grace, but that we have God's grace so that we can live into those moral standards. So that we can grow in greater faithfulness and greater faithfulness and greater faithfulness so that our lives actually reflect God's design. And only by his grace and his power. Let's pray. Well, Lord, I, yeah, I want to acknowledge that we need your grace. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you speak to anybody here today. If it's somebody who needs your grace to face a lustful imagination that doesn't reflect your design. If it's anybody here who needs your grace to work at reconciliation in a marriage that doesn't reflect your design, if it's anybody here that needs your courage, step out of a situation that's not okay, we pray that by your grace it would be so in all those circumstances. I pray, Lord, that every person here could be able to feel your presence and your power and your grace. We acknowledge yet again that oh, your grace is sufficient for us. That we are made strong in our weakness by your grace. And all your people say, amen.